Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stacy Scott, and I handle the marketing and client relations here at Wickham Financial and Insurance Services, and I'm also your host for today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's webinar and Lunch and Learn. Our topic today is one that will resonate with many of you, and it is estate planning. Uh, as we all know, estate planning is a vital part of our financial well-being and understanding the essentials is really crucial to secure your financial future and protect your loved ones. So we're ready. We're going to be joined today by Stan Faulkner of Paragon Legal Services and Stan is an expert in estate planning and he's going to share his insights on the five key components every estate plan should include. And as always, there's going to be a question and answer set session at the end of the webinar. And so if you have any questions uh, for Stan or for Graham, please uh, type those into the chat box, um, the Q&A chat box. And uh, we'll get one of those guys to answer those questions for you. And just a reminder that you're going to see Graham's calendar pop up periodically throughout the presentation. So if you would like to schedule some time with Graham or another member of the team, please just uh, click on that and select the time and date that work best for your schedule. And then we'll get that on the calendar. And I guess with all of that under the way, out of the way, I'm going to turn things over to Graham. Hey, thank you, Stacy, uh, and, and thanks for uh, everyone uh, being on the call or viewing uh, this Lunch and Learn. And, you know, I think it's uh, not to be a broken record, but, you know, a part of appropriate wealth management is also addressing your estate. And like we've mentioned before, everyone has an estate. You have a will, a wish, a directive on how you want your estate handled while you're alive and after you pass. Um, so it's just making sure with Stan and his team's help, uh, or just working with any estate attorney, making sure that you have the appropriate documents in place uh, that uh, demonstrates your wishes on how you want things handled while you're alive and after your past. I think each and every one of us um, has probably a story we could tell how important that is. So uh, without further ado, I know Stan's got a lot of information to cover uh, with Paragon Legal Services. He's a partner with us. Uh, Stan, uh, how about I'll let you jump in and take over the call? Thank you, Graham. I appreciate the opportunity to address your group. Um, again, and we've done this a couple of times. Always a pleasure to join these with you and just provide a little insight and information. Um, if folks don't know who I am, uh, Stan Faulkner, the founder of Paragon Legal, been practicing for over 20 years now. Um, in several states, and our main focus is in state planning uh, and real estate with some small business interests as well. So this is part of what we do on a regular basis is advise folks. Now, it, and today's topic is really short and sweet. It is just five points that you should consider or need to have in your estate plan. Um, and, and, and it will give you some guidance, some things to ask your state planning attorney or things to consider or things to review if you already have a plan in place already. Right. Um, and so these are just five topics that will, I think will help you make a clear, concise plan that actually works. And that's really the big thing is getting something that will work the way you want it to work and not spending money on something that just doesn't that fails for you in the future. So with that, with that in mind, First item on here, and stop me anytime with questions, Graham, if you have something or anybody else, feel free to just interject as I talk about this uh, briefly. The first one is when we make a plan, we want to have a clear understanding and a clear identity for our beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are people that receive your assets in the future, whether through a trust or a will, you still have to name beneficiaries. Um, and a clear definition would include the name of the individual and the class that they're in. So, for example, a class is made up of children, grandchildren, friends can also be in a class, right? Nie nieces and nephews, that's a class. But you would want to say, I want you know, to my children, name all of them, I leave X amount of dollars, right? Or X property. That's a clear definition of a beneficiary. If you 
if you just name a class without names, then essentially anybody that can qualify in that class, whether even if born after you pass, would qualify to receive. And it, it just it, it's becomes very broad in that case. You may not want that. And so it's best to be very clear about what your intentions are. OK. Second thing we want to provide in our estate plan or think about providing us clear instructions on what we're giving. So when we make a gift through an estate plan, it's called a bequest. And we want to identify clearly what we're giving out to them. And so what that also means is clearly what to do in case we don't have that asset anymore. So for, I'll give you an example of that. You would might say something like to my grandchildren, I leave them $10,000, period. Now that, that's pretty good, but the problem with that is what happens if you don't have that much money anymore? How do we then prorate that? Or does it fail entirely? So what I would add on to that is a clarifying statement at the end that would say, in the event my estate does not have sufficient funds for these gifts, my executor or trustee should abate pro rata, which means everybody decreases their gift by the same amount so that it's equal across the class. That's a clear instruction for your fiduciary, your executor or your trustee, so that they know exactly how to handle a potential problem that comes up. We just spent our money, right? We just don't have it anymore. And that way we don't have a confusion and a problem um, that requires all the beneficiaries to consent to something in the future, right? Often overlooked, but an easy problem to incur uh, and an easy problem to fix. Stand up. Quick question. Um, do you want me to move the slides for you or do you want to take control of that? Ah, well, let me do that for you too. I guess I, yes, here we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. I didn't want to interrupt you. It was great information. Yeah, I will, I will do that, right? So we identified our beneficiaries. We provided, here's our uh, instructions about ambiguity in the bequest and considerations. So the next thing that I want to bring up to folks is providing clear instruction or references to your property and property includes real estate as well as personal possessions. That's property uh, as a whole. And so uh, don't be confused when you just hear property. It's not just real estate. It's everything. It's all of your assets. So one thing that we run across a lot are ambiguities in describing our property because you may spend it over time, right? You may give it away over time. Um, one thing that we see is the bequest that references an outside list of property. While sometimes it's okay, but if you've made additions or subtractions to that list, but you've failed to update that list, you've created ambiguity. Um, or if you fail to get rid of an old list um, and uh, and I and identify that it's been destroyed, then you also create ambiguity. Now I have two lists sitting here. Which one is the last one? You know, where's the property uh, to be located for? We've seen lots of probate estate disputes over conflicting lists. So it's not a good idea to have that. You want to have clear identification. If it's a piece of real estate, the address for the real estate. If it's a personal possession that's significant, identify what it is. It's my grandmother's ruby ring that has three diamonds offset, right? Something like that is very clear about what it is and where it came from. Um, and, and it makes it easier for your executor or your trustee to distribute it and deal with it and find it located. Won't be confused about what exactly it is. Okay. Um, next thing we want to think about when uh, creating an estate plan is who serves as an executor or trustee. They're known as fiduciaries, which means they're in charge of your property and they, and they have a duty to other people to distribute or receive or, or send them those assets in the future. That's a fiduciary. And we want to be mindful of who that's going to be in a backup or multiple backups sometimes. One thing you can think about is when you set these up, sometimes you, you may name a sibling as an executor or a trustee, you have to be mindful of like that sibling may pass before you, right? In that case, what happens? Who's the, who's the backup or it's your spouse? 
who's the backup to your spouse in that case. Sometimes you want to have multiples or you want to have a mechanism that allows for a change in that circumstance. In other words, allowing beneficiaries to name who the successor might be in the absence of having one. Um, and sometimes you can have co-successor trustees or executors, multiple people serving. That's fine as well. It's just a good idea to consider who that person is going to be. Now, something that I I would layer into this is consider the background, the knowledge, the expertise of that person serving as well. You may have, you know, great relations with your sister. That's not the person that could handle assets, you know, and manage them appropriately and get them to where they're supposed to be. And so you may love her to death, but she simply doesn't have the capacity for it. And so you want to be mindful of their personality and what they're capable of doing and not capable of doing. You see lots of mistakes in that area. Stan, I have a quick question. Yep. If you don't have someone in your family or in your um, companion group that you would name as a fiduciary, are there other institutions that you can name and that can act in your behalf? Absolutely. Um, professional asset managers can serve in this capacity. You know, often people like Graham can serve in this capacity. Um, attorneys can serve. Mindful of that, though, is the drafting attorney cannot also be your executor or your trustee. CPAs can serve in this capacity. The one thing to think about there is often when that happens, they're allowed to charge a fee for their services. And so um, if it's a significant estate, you know, and we're talking lots of property, then a professional might be very useful in this case, right? Or if it's going to be open for a long period of time, like there's a trust distribution scheme that may last a, a couple of generations, a professional is probably the way to go in that case. Um, so you certainly can hire outside folks to, to serve in that capacity. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing we would want to be mindful of here too is if we have multiple trustees or multiple executors is how do those folks resolve their own internal disputes or can they act separately from one another? You know, you just want to be very clear and specific in uh, the powers that you grant those fiduciaries in, um, in your plan. So lastly, what we want to have here is an idea of a contingency in our planning, right? Um, you know, there are, when you make a plan, you may be 50 years old and you're going to live for another 30 years. Lots of things change in that time frame, right? And so when we make our plan, we want to have contingencies built in, like the, the, the passing of a beneficiary and what and how the estate is distributed in that case, right? Where does it go? Does it go to their children or does it abate and go back to the other beneficiaries? You just want to have that language in there so that your fiduciary knows what to do in the case something's not there or some person is not there anymore. Um, you also want to be thinking about what ifs in asset loss or the types of assets that you're giving out, right? If it's real property, make sure that we are actually transferring it out or we're not putting multiple people on a title. You know, you want to be thinking about how the asset may change over time too in other types of asset classes. So, um, one thing to be thinking about is if you're sitting down with a professional to make this plan is be mindful. They're going to ask you tough questions, right? Um, and they're going to really, you know, it's a personal conversation. And so be prepared to answer those tough questions in order to get past contingencies that could cause a problem, right? You know, if what if we're a blended family and it's a second spouse? How do the kids treat your new wife, right? That sort of thing. You want to be thinking about that and be mindful of how that may tr transpire after you pass, right? The relationships matter. And so thinking along all those lines become important in making a plan that really survives and works the way you want it to long term. Um, so these are, you know, the, the top five items that we try to go through um, when we're developing plans for folks and we're sitting down with them. And if you're sitting down with an advisor or an attorney, be mindful of these are the things that you should be listening for in those conversations um, and in, in order to make a good sound state plan that 
mirrors and it works as a strong companion to your wealth asset plan that you're going to set up with Graham. Um, these two things have to be, you know, well thought out and work together to make it work. Stan, I, I have a question to maybe add on to that. Where does the role of a child, maybe a minor, come into this? How, um, yeah. You know, question. Uh, maybe a health condition. Mm -hmm. um, how can you address that? Yep. So minors are, you know, we see them often in estate plans and, and they can create a, a bit of a, a hiccup in the plan is if you are leaving assets to a minor, keep in mind that they can't really possess or control that asset. You have to generally designate a person to work on their behalf, whether that's a, a trustee. Sometimes you're going to hold the asset and trust for that minor until they reach a certain age. Um, you want to be mindful of that, or you're going to leave it to their parent. Um, and if you're going to leave it to the parent, then you have to be mindful that if the parent takes possession, do they have clear instruction in your plan in order to handle the asset for the child as well? So um, I see it common where children are left assets without much thought, and it creates a headache if there isn't a plan wrapped around how that asset is managed for that child. So be thinking about those things when you're leaving assets to minors. Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah, thanks. Stacy. do we want to go ahead and open this up to a little Q&A? Absolutely. I have some questions for you, Stan. First yeah. of all, what is better, a will or a trust, if we want to avoid probate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and we see it all the time because people don't quite understand how a will works. And a will will designate who your assets go to, but it has to be proved by a judge in probate court. So if you want to avoid that process, and probate these days is long, and it's fairly expensive if you have to hire an attorney. And so um, the best way to do that is to set up a trust. To a, a trust automatically avoids probate. Your assets are held privately. It doesn't have to go through a court or a judge. It's not subject to public scrutiny in that regard. So it avoids that process altogether. Good question. Well, speaking of wills and trusts, is there a large difference in cost between those two? Yeah, I, I like that question. I get that a lot. I tell folks the uh, the difference is when you pay that cost, frankly, right? So a trust, when you draft one, it's a little more expensive up front, but it's time saving and it's expense down the road is minimal. A will, on the other hand, is cheaper up front, but when it has to go through the probate process through court, it's much more expensive in terms of time, headache, and cost if you hire an attorney end up being more expensive to probate than it would be to draft a trust now. So I tell folks like, when do you want to pay? That's really what it comes down to an hour later. Yeah. Okay. Good question. And uh, another question, is there a tax benefit to having a trust? Uh, yeah, there can be. Mm -hmm. So trust, uh, certain types of trusts avoid taxes and delay taxes. Right. And, um, one of the good things about a trust is if you set one up, you can end up with multiple step ups in basis of an asset as it transfers from one trust to another down the line. So give you an example where we did an estate plan for a husband who had all the assets in his name. So when he passed, he was giving some assets to his kids and some assets to his wife and dividing a trust into two more trusts. And then when she passed, the assets from her trust would go to the children's trust. That's two step ups in basis on those assets as they flowed from husband to wife to children. And that essentially wipes out capital gains taxes, potentially, when those folks receiving on the end go to liquidate or sell or transfer. So there is tax benefits. Just have to be you have to think through them. You got to work with your your financial planners at the same time that you're setting it up so that you're putting the right assets in there um, and then creating the correct trust mechanisms to get from one to the other. So yeah, significant savings can occur. It's usually later down the road when those save tax savings occur. Stan, I have an additional question on that. Um, I hear a lot going on from a 
legislative standpoint about uh, changing the stepped up provisions. Yep. Uh, what are you hearing on your side? Yeah, I, you know, I had a conversation just yesterday with the CPA and he thinks that there's going to be wholesale changes to um, tax codes and particularly gains. It's going to be easier to see a capital gain and to be taxed on it. They're going to be looking at basically every provision now that we get access to to avoid tax being revised in the next two to three years. Right. So the one big tax that we see right now is the federal estate tax is very high, right? The threshold is $11 million per person. When that sun sets in 25, the rest of these taxes associated with receiving assets are also going to be revised. And you're right. I think there is going to be, uh, they're going to make it harder to receive a step up in basis. But what I think is going to occur in that consequence is trust planning will be more important when that happens because the trust plans or trust codes are often exempted from basis uh, changes or tax changes when it comes to inheritance. So that's going to be big in two years. I, I really do think so. No, thank you. And one add on to that, I see so often or I hear so often just through our conversations with uh, you know, clients that we're potentially working with, the ones that we are existing that, OK, maybe I had a trust in place. Maybe I, I haven't really um, named anything in the trust. So it's basically mm -hmm. empty at this point. Yep. How would you address that? I would immediately be looking at where our assets are currently held and modifying that to name our trust as the holder of those assets. So I, I have seen that before where this really beautifully drafted trust, somebody spends thousands on that has zero assets to it. And so everything ends up going to probate court. And that's a big waste. So the first thing you would do is look at what assets do we have? Are, is it real estate? Then let's draft some deeds real fast and in quick claim deeds and put them in the trust. Are our assets held at somebody like Graham? Let's send the trust summary over to the financial planner and have those things retitled in the name of the trust. Um, it doesn't change how they're managed per se. It doesn't affect an income tax now. It doesn't affect property taxes on assets. It just affects how it flows in the future so it's an easy fix, relatively easy, but often overlooked. And so it just needs to be addressed immediately once we find out about it. Right. Yeah, I think uh, so So many of us feel like, OK, we've gone through the motion. Yep. We stopped to the we've talked to the state attorney. We've gotten some basic documents in place. We're done. That's not always true. Right. No. You have no. to take those extra steps and fund that trust and then review it. How often do you expect uh, that someone needs to review their legal documents like a will or a trust so on and so forth i you know um it's generally if you look at a time frame it's usually every few years but it's also when events happen in life so let's say you drafted a will when the kids were five and now they're 18. probably a good idea to look at it right or we had a plan and my mom was the executor or the trustee she's passed away probably need to look at it, right? Or we're significantly more, you know, um, wealthier now. Like we've inherited money ourselves or we've built a business that we didn't have before. Significant life events trigger the reframing of our financial planning, right? And this is part of that. Really, it should be. It's like if you start earning, like we have clients together that have built a business and the business starts to just really earn significantly for the owner, well, it's time to make the, ask the estate plan match what we've built so that we don't lose it. So any significant event like that should trigger a thought to have it examined. Right. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. I didn't mean to uh, take over that conversation. Stacy, do we have any other questions? Uh, actually, no, we don't, Graham. Um, We've, we've gotten through all of our questions. Okay. Well, let me wrap it up uh, real quick and thank everyone for being on the call. But I did want to kind of summarize, you know, the importance of, you know, if it's Stan and his team from a legal aspect or, or your financial team, you, um, you know, your accountants, your CPAs you work with, it's important to have all these pieces in place. Now, not everyone you're going to be talking to on a regular basis 
It might be annual, biannual, but it's important to have all these trusted advisors and all these areas of expertise to manage the wealth that you created. And so often when I'm talking uh, to students that come to my classes, my multi-day education courses on retirement planning or investing basics, risk management, so on and so forth, it's just important to have your team in place because you're your own corporation, right? Um, and you got to think about having the right people in place who can communicate and talk with each other to make sure that all your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed. So it's not one's more important than the other. I really do feel your financial advisor, your CPA, your accountant, your, um, your legal team is all equally important and make sure they communicate. I think that's really yeah. key, right? Agreed. I think that's really key. So yeah. thank you. Stacey. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers for joining us once again for our monthly Lunch and Learn session. And a big thank you to both Stan and Graham for our very informative uh, session today. I think that, you know, obviously preparation is the key and, and you've given us a lot of information to digest and think on in that respect. So please remember that you can always find our most current information, including our weekly wrap ups and these webinars on our social media pages, such as Facebook and LinkedIn, and also on our website. So please stay connected with us and let's continue on this journey to financial success together. Thanks again, Graham, Stan, and our viewers. Have a great day. Thank you all.